everyone, and welcome to today's program, Queer Clay Artists in Conversation with Mark Burns and Vic Quezada. I'm Genevieve Kaplan. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Associate Director of Communications and Stewardship at the American Museum of Ceramic Art. This exhibition is the second in our Making in Between series. The first, Making in Between Contemporary Chinese Ceramics, was in 2020 and focused on six first and second generation Chinese American ceramic artists who explored themes of cultural heritage, identity, language, politics, migration, and displacement. Making it between queer clay shifts the lens from national heritage to broader influences in, to broader influences on identity, and it centers queerness as an unapologetic presence. Queer clay features work by historical artists alongside contemporary makers. Mounting an exhibition that focuses solely on work by queer artists, Amoka brings less familiar narratives to the forefront of ceramics. Presented together for the first time, these works exemplify the compelling contributions of queer artists to the Western art canon. Before we begin the talk, I would like to thank Matthew Lim, Alexis Salas, Richard May, Steve Conti, and Pam Aliaga for their important contributions to this exhibition and the catalog. Our beautiful full color exhibition catalog is available for purchase at the museum store, and it was designed by Raquel Hazel from Salt Press. We also thank the Los Angeles County Arts Commission, the Dew Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Pasadena Arts Alliance for their generous support of this exhibition and catalog. Also, a friendly heads up, this event is being recorded and will be, and will be made available for everyone on AMOCA's website shortly. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Pam Aliaga, whose pronouns are they, them. They will be leading the discussion today. Pam was the co-curator for Making In Between Queer Clay, and they are also Amoka's amazing exhibition manager. Oh, so sweet. <laughs> Thank you so much, Genevieve, for that wonderful introduction. Um, before I start sharing some images, so just so those people who haven't gotten to visit the exhibition um, get to see the installation and the work currently that we have up for Mark Burns and Vic Casada. Um, I want to introduce our wonderful two artists that are joining us for this discussion today. Um, Mark Burns is a ceramic artist and educator who creates narrative personal works with a pop sensibility and sardonic humor. He studied illustration at the School of Dayton Art Institute in Ohio before he moved to Seattle and completed his MFA under celebrated ceramicist Patty Warashina and Howard Kotler at the University of Washington. Burns often creates works that mimic or reference domestic objects commonly manufactured in clay by carefully splicing together elements of functionality and decorative wares to create kind of this loaded taboo almost. Um, Burns' body of work embraces bad taste, strangeness, sex, and politics. His sensibility is often ascribed to his queer identity and his visibility in the field has reoriented questions of suitable subject matter and created a platform for other artists to explore traditionally taboo content. Throughout his career, Burns has exhibited widely and has been collected by many museums, including Rednick Gallery in Washington and the Museum of Art and Design, New York. Uh, Mark has, was also elected a fellow of the Mar American Craft Council in 2018 and collected by MOCA also. <laughs> Beautiful. And before I share some of those pieces that we have currently in our exhibition, I want to introduce our second artist that will be joining us today, Vic Casada. And Vic Casada is an interdisciplinary artist exploring hybrid forms of Indigenous Latinx history and the function of these histories in contested lands, primarily in the U.S. to Mexico border. They work with a variety of mediums, video, performance, sculpture, and ceramics. They incorporate bound objects, man-made and natural elements like dirt, soil, flora, corn, and combine them with bound objects like bricks, reclaimed trash, chains, cans, and barbed wire. Casada has received numerous grants and awards from institutions, including the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation and the Artist Relief Grant supported by Americans for the Arts and Creative Capital and the Massachusetts Cultural Council. Casada's residencies include the Lost and Found Lab, um, Cobham, Connecticut, and the Liberation, Liberation's residency at Mass Mocha. And the Vermont Studio Center. Currently, Casada lives in Connecticut and is an assistant professor of practice at Hampshire College in Western Massachusetts. 
Wonderful. So let me just share my screen right now and just show you, show everyone a couple of the pieces that are currently in display now. So we have a wonderful just shot of the exhibition. And then we have Mark Burns' wonderful piece um, titled Extra Big Wiener with some detail shots. And it'll be lovely to hear Mark talk a little bit more about this, but we also have this newsboy just shouting out all the good news that's happening. <laughs> <laughs> and I got a little bit of mustard on the lips for our casted figure there. And we also have Plague and Lavender, which we are very excited now. Um, this piece is now part of the Amoka collection with these wonderful details of viruses and the Keith Herring details as well with Saints. Going on, we also have the Quesada's work, um, Hermanex. And right next to it, we have Stainless. And then we have uh, the, oh, sorry, I forgot about that. And we have more detail shots of this piece as, long, as well as stainless. And we'll get to hear a lot more from the artist throughout Q&A because we'll be asking questions about these pieces and hopefully um, everyone in the audience gets to also ask their questions. So I'll stop sharing here. And I'll start off with an icebreaker. Um, just because I know it takes a little bit for artists to warm up <laughs> when it comes to the bigger questions. But I was curious to know um, what kind of toy or Barbie would you be if you had to be one? Mark, do you want to take this one first since you're kind uh, of... <laughs> I, was think, I was thinking about it because um, you guys need to remember, as I was on the earth before Barbie was. And... Uh, I didn't have much contact with anything like that. So I will um, defer the Barbie question. If anything, I'm more of a G.I. Joe. So I love that. <laughs> that suits my persona much better than a Barbie. But if I was, it'd be a weird Barbie. Like the girls who lived across the street from me cut off all their hair and drew things on them with magic markers. So anyway. Those are creative Barbies. Yeah, they were. <laughs> um i th i think that if i mean i thought about the question too and i was like i, I this is weird because i don't i don't feel like that's my persona but then i was like well i guess if i had to be one then it would have to be um a future forward thinking barbie that was not a barbie but it was sort of like a non-binary like android situation but then i also thought about something else and i actually really love the muppets yeah. and then i was it was like i i would be like gonzo you know gonzo the one with like yeah. the creature and then camilla the chicken i'd be their love child i love that um i didn't want to ask a muppet question again i i'm notorious for asking muppet questions to people <laughs> but Gotta love them. Great. So let me start off our discussion by just referencing Matthew Lim's introduction essay that's included in the catalog, where he talked about this collection of ceramic work betraying a language of belonging and desire for acceptance. Can you two share a little bit about how these ideas of belonging, acceptance, and identity play out in your work? Who goes first? Um, I'll take a stab at it. This is a hard question. Um, given how long I've been in the field. Mm -hmm. um, I think if I had to pick two of those, it would be acceptance and identity. Belonging, there was a time which I thought that would never happen. And mm -hmm. it was pretty rough, let me tell you, especially when you make the kind of work I do, because there's no question about what it is. And I think the idea of acceptance um, came to me in the strangest way possible. It wasn't how, what, what they were, but how they were made. And the acceptance came through my ability to actually craft. And often um, the people were, were dumbfounded when they got up close to them to realize how well made they were. 
and I had any number of uh, reviews over the years that said things like, you may not like what he's saying, but you can't default how they're made. And so the acceptance came to me in that way. Um, and believe me, there were people who, who did not like what I wanted to make. They didn't want to look at it. They thought they were ugly. They didn't think they had anything to do with anything other than the fact that they were really nicely put together. Mm -hmm. And that was the hook. And there were people who loved that. And then there were people who felt angry that they had been sucked into paying attention to these things mm -hmm. simply because um, a surface viewing is what reeled them in. And when they realized what they were looking at, they don't like it. And so, I don't know, belonging comes and goes. And uh, one day you're, you belong and the next day that you don't. And I'll throw this out here. I mean, I just turned 73 years old. It happens that you no longer fill a certain number of quotas in ceramics, mm -hmm. that um, you are sort of shuffled off somewhere. And, uh, and be so belonging doesn't do that for me. Belonging means you're always there. But uh, anyway, I'm sure that sounds very sour, but it does happen, you know? So. I think it's something we haven't heard in artist talks, um, at least for the queer clay conversations. Um, mm -hmm. Since you're one of the older artists in the exhibition, along with Howard Kotler, Ramakhan, and Sasha Rostov, who is now passed, um, I don't think we get to talk about that idea of belonging once you get to that age bracket where you're no longer showing or maybe not meeting those quotas anymore or probably not seen as producing as much as you need to. Well, it, it does um, it does exist. Mm -hmm. And it's really funny, historical. Let me tell you a short thing here, which will put this into context. Mm -hmm. um, I was once sitting in an airport gate. I always sat away from the gate where the obvious students were going mm -hmm. to Nsika. You could spot they play on their shoes, blah, blah, blah. I'm sitting there and this kid presents himself in front of me and he goes, hey, you. And I said, yes, can I help you? And he goes, my dude friend over there says that you're some kind of historical person. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't remember your name. And I told him what it was and he went, oh yeah, we saw your stuff in that like uh, clay history class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just... And it was, I think it was the first time I realized how, I've been in this for over 50 years, how mm -hmm. far I had come with it, that I'm being confronted by this kid. And he wasn't bad. I gave him $10 and, and said, buy your friend a drink. He sent you over here. <laughs> and so in my mind, I simply became that historical dude. And uh, it pops up every now and then. But there is such a thing as ageism in this field. And you're established. And so you, we don't need to hear anything from you anymore mm -hmm. we know what you're capable of and you need to get out of the way for somebody else which i'm always happy to there's always a faster gun coming up somewhere but it does i was surprised that it it does exist and uh anyway and again i'm sure that sounds sour to a lot of people but it does happen um where did you go what are you doing with yourself and you're no less potent than you were you're just a little slower than you used to be so okay and now i think time for Vic to speak to this. Hey, Mark, thank you for that share. Um, you know, when you were talking about your experiences, I it just really struck me that there is an immense amount of wisdom um, in this, in this um, discussion. And yeah, I think that it's not something that we also often talk about in queer communities as sort of like you know, there's so many pe queer people who have passed or, you know, I, I mean, obviously we have this history with um, with AIDS and HIV. So a lot of like the elders have passed. So, you know, I think that for me, um, being in a room with people who are older or just have more wisdom, you know, immediately I there is a deep appreciation for that. So I just I want to say that right now. Um, But, you know, I think that this question, you know, it, I really had to think about it because I was thinking about what is all of this, like I, queer identity or one feeling accepted or this notion of belonging. And I think that 
what came to my mind is thinking more about where we're at in like where we're at in the country in the United States and also what's happening in the world. And I think that um, there's this website, which the ACLU has, it's called, it's, it, it's mapping attacks on LGBTQ rights in the U S state legislature. And they said that right now, currently as it stands, there's over 507 anti LGBTQ bills in the U S and obviously there's like a ton that keep on passing. Honestly, I cannot keep track of like what's happening. So I think that we got to kind of think about like what's happening right now in, in like sort of, you know, culture laws, policies, and that'll sort of still put it in context how relevant like um, queer identity is and also sort of like how important it is for um, there to be acceptance and a sense of belonging in the community. And when I made the work, the terracotta work called Edmond X, it, basically it was just sort of an homage to um, my me and my sister. We actually were raised in a very conservative um, Christian family. And um, I think that it's sort of like a rep repairing. There's like a sense of repair mm -hmm. in the work that I'm doing. And it's sort of, um, and it's sort of addressing, you know, limited and individual choices that um, we had growing up in terms of like identity and freedom. So, you know, I think that um, it's it's still very relevant. I think queer queers like queer making art is sort of like it's it's like it's like incredibly relevant. I would agree. No, oh, I would. Thank you. Thank you. You two have, have really taken that question, um, I think, in a different perspective than I've heard, and I, and I love both of them. Um, but let me ask you the next question. In both of your work, um, the reason I thought you guys would make two wonderful speakers is because, um, Vic, I know you work in Resquache, so the idea of just using a lot of more unconventional and thrifted and recycled materials is something that I saw in Mark too, when he talks about um, kind of using those thrifted figures or casting um, molds, you both bring in unconventional material into your work. It's not just, I mean, it could all be ceramic, but you guys decide to go out of the box if anything else. Um, and that's something I wanted to ask you both. Um, what made you kind of want to push your work a little further? when it came to materiality. Yeah. Vicky, you want to answer that first? Sure, I can do that. So, you know, I you we you you've said the phrase rascuache, right? So, rascuache, the definition is um Mexican American Chicano culture. They basically what happens is people in the culture will take found objects and and it's basically to when it'll be recontextualizing the object, reconfiguring the object or reimagining the object into art. Well, this word itself came from when people would take an object and turn it into something else. But basically, my father and his father, they would, you know, they'd find found objects. And basically, because of out of financial need and necessity, they'd turn it into something different. So for an example, in my family, there used to be seven to eight of us if a grandmother came with us and we had a minivan and it had no air conditioner but what my dad did he's kind of sort of a really really interesting guy he wired and installed a cooling system to keep us cool when we would travel around because we lived in texas so this sort of like spirit of survivalism uh it kind of really inspired me to think about objects outside of their intentions. And I think that um, it just made me think like of creative strategies and solutions. So yeah, it, it just, you know, I just started seeing art in places that art wasn't like necessarily supposed to be at. And I think that Mark, earlier we were, you, I overheard you talking about how you had a relationship with thrift stores and, um, you know, you, you sort of like to source found object. And I, I totally agree with that. I do too. I used to, I used to go to this, I used to wake up like at five and go to a flea market 
And I would just walk the flea market for like two hours because I was hoping to find something, some sort of object that kind of spoke to me. So yeah, objects, I'm fascinated with them. And I, and I really like to see them outside of their intention. So that's, that's a lovely thought. Yeah. Uh, me too. Um, I think a, a lot of, a lot of times people have forgotten how I started, I started as an illustrator. And then when I went into clay, um, that was a big breakthrough because I was actually able to deal with the three dimension part of it as opposed to being flat with the illusion of three dimensions. Also, I'm an old Ohio boy and um, my interest in things um, revolved around sort of untoward things. I was making things at the time where people hadn't, seen before and had started that um, proselytizing of my own culture. I didn't want, I don't, I'm not Japanese, so I don't do Japanese style ceramics or Chinese or whatever. There's a great wealth of information and passion in this country, especially in ceramics. Also, I grew up in a place, Ohio, where there was an intense amount of ceramic manufacture. Homer Laughlin, Fiesta Ware, Lane, you name it. And those things were ready, but I saw them every day. And so I started working them into um, the things I was making as mile markers, uh, an identity marker that, that was like a, a dog pissing on its territory. Those things I could find, those things were at hand and they spoke volumes. They And I knew that from the years I spent as a restoration worker that all cultures have such things. And I was interested in the low end, low culture, I suppose the high culture. And art school tried to beat my homegrown sensibilities out of me. Um, it's trashy, nobody wanted to look at it. And I just kept using it. And um, again, my markers, identities, many of the, those things and the things I've made over there are me. They took my place in whatever the tableaus or narratives were and um, later, uh, there's, but I didn't use a lot of them. And now that I'm in this particular situation where that's what I have to work with, I'm glad I had those experiences. So I agree with what you're saying. I mean, these things have power. And I saw amazing things at the restoration studio um, that were important to people from the highest of the high to the lowest of the low. And that kind of energy can't be denied. It can be harnessed. And so you find something and put it into, into your work. So I think that had a lot to do with it. Um, and uh, it was interesting because what happened to me finally was um, some years ago when uh, Shigaraki opened in Japan, mm -hmm. I got picked to be one of the, the 10 artists for their inaugural, which dumbfounded everybody. <laughs> People I knew were going, they didn't pick him, did they? you know what he's going to send over there? And we went, and uh, it was the nicest thing anybody ever did. The night before the museum opened, they had a, a great ga a gala, and uh, the head curator stepped forward and said, we've purchased our first acquisition. And he pointed out, and he said, and there, there he is. And you could sort of hear people in the room gasp. It was kind of funny, because I was, you know, Adrian Sachs and Betty Woodman and all this. He said, we bought this piece because he's the most American. And I thought, this is really interesting. It's like all those years, um, I just felt more comfortable working in a context that I understood, not only from here, but from here also. And so I really enjoyed the story of, you know, the, the cooling system and all that sort of stuff, because I, I tend to think in those kind of terms also, how do I make this work? and fit it in and so anyway it's been a long trip uh, I, believe it. Uh, <laughs> I think I, I really do love that definition of resquatcha being the spirit of survivalism um it's just one of those things that you kind of see growing up where you, and also it kind of comes out in your process of work where mark you were talking about how the things you're more comfortable with and you just make it work um when you go look for those objects that kind of call to you and i can see that in both of you that you're well kind of i was really struck when vic thank you for saying that because mm -hmm. that happens to me 
you look at many things hoping that one of them will speak to you uh -huh. move you in in some ways and i i really appreciated you saying that because that's a hard thing for people to understand uh -huh. you don't just pick the first thing you have to look for it and then yeah. there's a kind of marriage between you uh -huh. and, and and the object uh -huh. and especially now that i'm re i'm taking them back to their basic i mean i find them but I strip everything off of them except for the clay body. I start them anew. And so there's a sort of rebirthing process going there as well. So Ooh. we'll, we'll then, back on that. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes, you know, I'll pick up objects and I, you know, I just they kind of just sit there for a while. Like some have sat there for years. And then I walk in one day and I'm like, oh, I know what you're gonna do. You know, so it's like, it's like, it's, it's, I, I don't know how, how your process works, but I don't think that mine necessarily makes sense. It's like, did the chicken come before the egg or did the egg before come before the chicken? It really, there's like no rhyme or reason the way that I, I make these things. It's not like the object like will dictate it. It's sort of like sometimes even the process of like the concept also, you know, it, it just, it's weird. It's. It doesn't make sense to me sometimes. Me either. It's like <laughs> it, sometimes they they yell at you, and yeah. you have no choice. It's like finding a, a lost puppy on the street. You have to take it home with you. Yeah, I've got boxes of stuff in here behind me from the last like four years of things. I thought not today, but maybe tomorrow. Yeah, and, and it depends on uh, what my thought processes are about right. things, and um, that it it comes in handy given the the trajectory I'm on right now I thought and they speak of age and use and love I have yeah. things that I know yeah. people loved I stuck them right in there so I appreciate that I feel pretty much the same way about them they speak or they don't yeah some of them take longer than others right yeah, <laughs> yeah. but That's it's nice right. to have a collection of them it's nice to have that collection yeah yeah Great. Um, so my next question is, how does thinking about craft influence your artistic work? And how does being a queer artist who works in the craft field contribute to that dialogue? This would be more your perspective, how you think um, your work is contributing currently. Mm. I don't remember who went last. Um, Mark? I'll, I'll, jump, I'll <laughs> jump on this one because I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm the oldest. <laughs> When I started, um, especially through the, the illustrative years in, in working, craft was um, a word used in all the studies I was undertaking. What is your craft? How And mostly it was like, how well can you craft this thing? Mm -hmm. And especially when you were working with really extreme narratives, the craft often carried you across. Um, it was a way, again, I, I in some ways, it's a way to lure people in. And then what happened was, at that time, craft was king. How about did you handle the material? What do you do? How succinct were you with it when you got ready to work with it and all that? And of course, now there's a, a there's been a big, it's been a kind of a sea change in it. That, that, that in many ways, for some people, that's not an issue. The crafting they're doing is simply assembling or putting together. And there's always this, there's always the manipulation of the material going on, but it's changed and it loosened up again uh, somewhere along the line. And it made things a little easier for people. You felt less um, smothered by it. You know, you were judged on, you know, if you were a potter, how well you trimmed your work, if you were a hand builder, how well did your pieces fit together? Um, and uh, so, I think I, but I always think about it. Did I make it as well as I could, or does it look like I gave up in the middle of it somewhere, and you know, just let it go, get away from me? So, but, that, but I'm of that age where craft was beaten into you. Mm -hmm. It must be well done, or nobody will take it seriously. So, I don't know. I'm glad some of it lifted, but that feeling never really quite goes away. When I take a look at them, even down to when people turn my things over, how I sign my work are little objects all on their own. So that when they pick it up and turn it over, there's something else on there 
there's it's kind of like a surprise buried in a piece of cake somewhere. There are all sorts of little things hidden in them. So, you know, craft was a big deal. It really cool. was. But it's, weird, it's strange to I'll stop and think of all the institutions that have taken the word craft out of their names. Mm. It's no longer the California College of Arts and Crafts. It's just the California College of Art. Right. So the idea that craft became an unpleasant moniker I don't get it. It's still it's still relevant, and I think especially now in a uh, a time when you see people um, trying to re-embrace that the longevity of the object. I think is important. Skills another thing. Craft is some other thing. So anyway, I hope that that's my explanation for it. Anyway. Yes. So. You know, when I was, when you, when we, you know, thinking about the questions beforehand, I was, I started begin to think about, you know, craft as like the, um, sort of having a negative connotation. And I think that craft has been associated with women, like women's like artwork and, um, I mean, there's, there's even, there's a history that's related. There's like a whole history on like how women started making things after the industrial revolution. And these like, sort of like these art pieces were considered craft. And that's sort of like why there's been this like negative connotation towards the, the term craft itself. But I thought about, you know, I mean, as like, we, we do dabble in craft, um, that's that's what ceramicists do um and i was thinking about like craft and value like some people you know mark you talked about how they dropped the name craft why did they drop the name craft i think it's because it's in some ways it's like lowbrow it's sort of looked down upon and i think that too also like as um i think that craft and like craft is sort of like I want to say it's sort of like the queer gay, gay sibling in like the art world because it's not like painting, you know, painter painting has like a totally different trajectory in the art field. So I don't know. I, I just, I kind of tend to think about craft as being like the queer sibling, the queer like sibling that's like kind of like doesn't care and is doing their thing. So um that's sort of, you know, what I thought about in this context. Um, yeah, I think that's. I think a, a lot of, that's pretty interesting observation. I mean, in the beginning, it was like your worth was your skill. So if we substitute mm -hmm. craft for skill, what was your, you know, when you were a student, you were learning people would say things to you. Nobody will ever buy that. Mm -hmm. That makes any sense. And so. You won't. You, you don't go to a store and buy something that isn't well made, and so it took on this other weird energy, this persona of its own. The thing you made had to be made well. Mm -hmm. You couldn't send something out and have somebody buy it, and when they put it on the table, it scarred their fine furniture. I mean, that went. But I think a lot of the, the thing about dropping the name had to do that it does feel lowbrow. It feels very, you know, painting with Elky Summer on the educational channel years ago or there used to be a host of craft shows on television a long long time ago on the off channels throwing sewing painting this kind of thing and so slowly as things uh, progressed forward craft was quiet it did it doesn't go away i know a lot of people who make unbelievably beautiful things it's a skill and with the, the word craft you can tie two sticks together and that's a craft you're making something mm -hmm. and so the idea that craft it depends on what it is what its intention is i think and people make things to the best of their ability by the yeah. decision yeah. they make so i think that's true i mean there are people who make amazing things i could never do in a million years but and i enjoy that um but i think the idea that the craft is it's not a religion and uh you know again the simple act of making something is a craft in and of itself. You gotta make decisions. Maybe they're not apparent in the, the thing that appears, but it's still there. 
So I think it's a shame they did it because they made it sort of a dirty word. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then also, I mean, we have, you know, I mean, I think that because in the context that we're talking about, we also have to take into consideration like the art markets, you know, it's like the art markets are the defining, they're sort of, they define like what is, what is good and what is not good or what is like craft or what is like fine art. So yeah, I think craft is, it, it's a it's an interesting question that you asked because I think it really is multi layered in the ways that one tries to unpack what craft is. Yes, I be, I believe you're exactly right. Mm -hmm. I gave up after a while. I just go I just go in and make stuff. It's like I try to make them as well as I can, and that, that's uh, again. Um, but I think for me, part of that was my entry at a, a certain point many years ago. How nicely they were made and at this point it's like um that was kind of a yoke mm -hmm. in a way and so a lot of so i started pushing other things into it and started to break the cycle of that but um yeah so i agree Vic. i mean i think it's it's a much more complicated question and i think the art market has a lot to do with it and there's still i mean but somebody paid thousands of dollars for a banana tape to the wall so <laughs> oh, my God. what Just do you saying, know <laughs> i tried taping broccoli to a wall but nobody bought it so it's just like uh, well i would have bought it one <laughs> probably not at the high value of the banana i think i got it around here somewhere broccoli, i'll send it to so. you you can fuck with you make something out, useful out of it so um, um but i really love your comment mark about the fact that craft was really beaten into you early on in schools and I think the separation between craft and skill it's hard for people to let go of those two not it being is. one it so is. it's currently being challenged I see it in work nowadays oh yes mm -hmm. and I'm excited yeah. for it so I'm excited. yeah same mm -hmm. same well if it doesn't it, it, I think the same things because my first impulse is like you know I tend to think of it in, the, in those terms of how it was put together reinforced by the years I spent as a restoration modeler, mm -hmm. it had to be perfect. It had to, you know, when you're handling a thing that's worth half a million dollars, you know, a lot of times I'd think, well, maybe this Dresden milkmaid is ha handling a machine gun, but I, but I couldn't do it. People are paying for perfection and having that specific thing brought back as it was. That's so, hard. yeah. So craft is uh it's loosened up a lot, which has given a lot of people opportunity who make amazing things who may not have that particular, we're not all Michelangelo. No, it just yeah. needs practice. Do you know what I mean? It just needs practice, really. Yeah, so. I think it, you know, it sure means, it, it, it doesn't mean practice. So, mm -hmm. um, but uh, at this point, I'll keep on making things this way <laughs> until I, they throw I mean, some dirt should. on me. <laughs> Yeah. Well, anyway. You know, I just I was actually just having a conversation with my student this week and we they were talking because there's sort of the some of the generation that is sort of pushing back on like perfectionism and sort of like having everything measured out and everything's like precise. And some of them are purposely making things like uneven and and you know, I told them, I said it's fine, you know, I'm happy that you're doing this it's great that you're pushing back on sort of these like these notions of perfection I said but also to something that if you're going to be making these decisions then you should be conscientious and purposeful with the decisions that you're making is like you can't sort of lean into the mistake rather than sort of just saying you're making a thing and it just you know, there has to be like a sense of purpose as to why you're doing this or an embellishment. So this is something that I've also been thinking about, like with students and, you know, even for myself, because I think that teaching is so much about like you're learning, you're also learning with your students and they're teaching you. So, yeah. Indeed they are. I, I, I'll I attack an addendum on that. I think it has to do with like talking because I started seeing it a while a while back when I was teaching full time, that um, things would come in and there would be sometimes heated discussions about whatever 
the work was. And I used to say, well, I, I'm not, you know, um, I'm, you need to think about who's looking at it. What do you, what do you want from them? If it's, if it's so opaque, they'll just turn around and walk away from it. They'll scratch their head. I said, your largesse, your invitation doesn't have to be big, but it has to be something that feels the person, the, the person feels drawn in. Mm -hmm. They want to understand this thing. Mm -hmm. I said, if it's so impenetrable, I said, you can afford to be slightly generous. If you want me to consider this thing and to think about it, what is that thing? I don't know. I said, but when you lose the ability to speak directly to an observer and not give them some place to start, mm -hmm. then you're in trouble. And I said, I think the people who are really good at this do that in many ways. They form questions. You're looking at this and you're going, why did this person make this thing? That's a kind of invitation right there. I'm going to look at it a little closer. I'm going to find something there. And so they used to just shake. I said, it can't all be blobjects. And um, that um, all great works from 5,000, 50,000 years or five minutes ago have some sense of invitation. Mm -hmm. I, want to move, I want to move toward this thing in some way and yeah. teach yeah. myself something, if nothing else. Uh, and uh, and we, we've seen that a lot on our tours with this exhibition. <laughs> we get a lot of intrigue um, with both of your guys' work. So it's been <laughs> it's been fun seeing all the kids just getting really close and just kind of being detected. That's why it's interesting. It's like, and I'm sure Vic's had this. It's like, why would you do this? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we've had a lot of we've had a lot of good questions that. From them. <laughs> now it seems like we're running out of time we want to get to q a so i'm going to skip okay. over to our last question um just because i want to have enough time for people to ask all the good questions mm -hmm. but when beth and i were curating this exhibition um we thought it was important to include those historical figures in the ceramic community to help the public better understand um, that queer artists have been around for a very long time um we have not seen much of this in the craft community. How, and I'm curious to know, how can art spaces and museums better improve for inclusivity for queer artists? This would be more of like your guys' thoughts. I don't think you could do it any better than making in between. Oh, so sweet. I mean, I wasn't grabbing for a con. <laughs> no, I, I think oh, you deserve you. it. I mean, not only was the catalog beautiful, but insightful writing about everybody. I learned a lot by reading, you know, the, the 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 essays on people. But I think that it comes and goes, mm -hmm. and I think that that, that um, those places that that are strong enough to give space to people like us to be able to speak to, and it's starting too with African Americans, other Indigenous peoples who make amazing stuff, make great work. And now given the possibility to it because I came out of a, a situation in which it was pretty much straight white people. Mm. And I went to school with a, a pretty diverse bunch of people, even in Ohio. And they always made amazing things, but their opportunities for showing or galleries and that kind of stuff were very tiny. And it happened to me once they found out you were gay, they didn't want to show you anymore. Yeah. They didn't want the taint of that. You know, and so my... <laughs> My way to deal with it was just to keep on pushing. I didn't know how to do anything else. I, I can't pretend to be straight and I can't pretend to be a woman and I can't pretend to be anything other than I am. And so, and I think that that that's, was not bad. It was necessary at the time to survive. Don't forget, don't forget. I was fired from my first full-time job at an art school for being gay. Wow. Um, and with no recourse. Things were fine until I said it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was, and the students were dumbfounded because they thought something progressive was going on there. Don't forget Howard was nearly denied tenure oh, at UW. Wow. It was discussed openly at his tenure meeting that they didn't want a person like that being given that kind of freedom at the university. Mm -hmm. It's loosened up a lot, which is really great. So there's some headway being made, I think. But don't forget, your history can repeat itself. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's the thing that, that I worry about all the time for everybody. 
you need to make your things and have them seen. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the show that you made is really important because I think that I, that I personally, that's the first time I've ever seen or heard of a ceramic show being a queer artist. Um, so, and I think that this is sort of like what needs to happen is I think that, you know, museums are cult basically they're cultural hubs and they may not be aware of the, they may or may not be aware of how important they are in, in creating cultural, they're cultural producers. Um, and in that sense, there's, they hold a lot of power, a cultural capital power, and they singly, they single-handedly can support marginalized and disenfranchised artists. And in doing so, basically what it does is it's shaping the cultural landscape. And, you know, just unpacking what that means is I think is like, how, how can institutions make a difference and honestly i'll even say it's from the ground up i think that it's like they they have to start hiring faculty and i'm sorry start hiring like staff that is able to um that you know marginalize people because i think that it's like you can hire all the people you want but if you're not hiring the people that like actually are doing the work and living that kind of lifestyle i think that there's just there's more of more of a push in that sense and then the like let's say for instance you're queer gay you're african american you're latino you're indigenous and you're you know you're making decisions of like supporting other you're supporting shows i think that this i think that you're a, the, as um hold on i'm trying to think about this as a staff you're able to support that person in that place so i think that it is hiring people but it's also you know start like making programs like setting aside grant money and it's just there's it, it's a lot of components that are required to sort of like support the people at the margin so you know i think that this is something that institutions should really think about and it's instead of being like saying that they're going to do it or you know they even make Latin acknowledgments. It's like actually just doing it. I agree. I agree with that. I mean that I got in trouble with the faculty, especially when I was chair for it, because it was well known that I was always looking for mm -hmm. queer, gay, LGBTQ, marginalized people to come in. And I could help them in a lot of ways through my own experiences or support their work. And that was a battle. And I worked at that school for nearly 30 years. And one day a faculty member said, Don't you, why can't you get some straight person in here? And I said, because for every one place like this where I'm running a program where people feel free mm -hmm. to make the work they need to make, no apologies, just make what you need to make. It's a safe space for you to make this stuff. I said, well, there are a hundred others that won't let them do it. There may be some holdover from the olden days, the people that fired me. A lot of those people stayed in power for a very long time, and they put their foot down on all this stuff because they couldn't understand how this change was happening, mm -hmm. and they weren't interested in any of it. And so I saw that myself because I've been in lots of schools and lots of different places. And in some places, they were... Now you see people actually sort of trying to repair that. Mm -hmm. But there was a time when they didn't. And it was the kiss of death for a lot of people. Faculty couldn't work with them because they couldn't understand where they were coming from. And that's and it's glad I'm happy to see that it's changing. It's um but it, it was an always an uphill fight, you know. And I didn't feel like I needed to justify them being there. They were making good work. They were artists, creative individuals, men, women, trans, mm -hmm. people of color. I had the best experiences there with my grads before I, I gave it up um, because of that. No, they just wanted, they wanted to work. And you got you had to give them a place to work. And a lot of schools are coming around. So 
I, I, you are, you were that change, Mark. I feel like, um, I think we talked before and, and another artist talk about the idea of just like queer mentors being something that is change, mm -hmm. um, creating that safe space for everyone and just like kind of teaching the next generation or teaching sure. the next movement. And, and, and I'll say this, I mean, I had written to you today and I said, I'm sorry, Howard's not here. You would have liked him. It was a handful. This I've heard not. many stories. I think <laughs> we would have all had a blast. <laughs> well, I will say probably 99.9% .9 of them are true. Um, mm -hmm. I but he, um, without him, I wouldn't, I was, I am the last of my kind mm -hmm. in a historical context. Um, I took what he started and brought it to um, a culmination. Mm -hmm. Before he died, he told me, he said, don't, don't do what I did. Please don't do what I did. Mm -hmm. I said, what's that supposed to be? He said, hide. Mm -hmm. And that was my legacy. And I miss him every day. He was way more important than, than you know, just some plates with some things on them. But uh, anyway, I mm -hmm. did the best I could. And uh, it's, it's been an okay ride. I'm still going to make things. And you should. <laughs> oh, thank you for sharing. Um, and we're just about that time that I'm going to open it up for Q&A. And for anyone who has questions for our artists, you can write the questions into the chat or you can use the raised hand emoji and just ask out loud. But if you're a bit shy, I'll read them out for you. <laughs> Zoom is the strangest thing. Isn't it? It, it really is. I kind of miss I've it. seen three or four people here I know really well. <laughs> they seem to have disappeared. Isn't that <laughs> called ghosting? I think it's called ghosting. That or just like a miss, you know, bad connection. <laughs> oh. So meanwhile, we wait for a question. I don't see any raised hands. Um. I'll ask a question just because I'm I'm really curious now if there was a time in your guys's artistic profession that you felt that the work wasn't well received at all by the audience. Oh yeah. I know Mark, you have plenty. <laughs> I had more things sent home than you can possibly <laughs> imagine. Sent back from shows than you can possibly imagine. Can I tell you the, the best critique about my work I ever had? I sold a big piece, which is now in a private collection to a man in Philadelphia and he took it home and a week later he brought it back to the gallery and said can I have my money back or can Mark make another piece for me and so Helen Drutt who was my dealer at the time said to him I don't understand why are you bringing this back and he said well my wife hates it my kids are afraid of it oh, and the wow. dog won't stop barking at it <laughs> So I thought that was so great. I said, I'll make you something else. I made the most vanilla thing you ever saw, and they were just really happy. But it was the part about his dog wouldn't stop barking at it. That, I thought that was, was the breaking was, point. It was really great, yeah. So, yeah. Vic, have you experienced that too? You have, um, I, you know, I think my experience was people didn't understand my artwork. So I think that they I mean in some crits were not very generous because people didn't understand it but I don't know I I haven't had that opportunity yet and I I you know I yeah I I await I await that experience is for a dog to, <laughs> to bark at. who knew dogs could like... be such such vicious critics let me let me tell you and I, here's I can... the thing it's like you are you are your own and this is an old person thing for you here. The theme here tonight, I guess, for me, um, you are unencumbered in a way that I was not. And strangely enough, it's never talked about much, but um, because look at the people that I worked with, Kotler, Orishina, and Sperry. Top of the line, A-list, Howard has his pro had his problems, but the mm -hmm. thing is, and uh, I was in school with Ann Courier mm -hmm. and David Furman and a whole lot of people who've risen up over the, the many years. Mm -hmm. And 
ask any of them how long it took to get out from under the shadow of those people. Mm -hmm. It was a loving and dreadful thing all at the same time mm -hmm. to be your own person. And so that mercifully, people say, oh, I worked with Mark or whatever, but it's not quite the same as it used to be. It was, and uh, so I don't know if you guys knew that or not, but it was hard for us to I identify ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, when you're working okay. with people that are, are that potent, mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult because you don't want to come off like an imitator. So well, that's, 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 that's part of history is that, that, that don't get talked about very much. It hampered many people. Hmm. So, you know, or they, they stopped because they felt they could never climb out from under that shadow. So. Uh, I mean, you came from a real strong cohort, that's for sure. <laughs> Mark, great mentors. Uh, I that was a, 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 a trilogy of terror right there. I believe it. <laughs> uh, and we have one last question by Anna Wagner, who wants, um, whose question is, can you explain about vulnerability in your work? And do you feel you can be more vulnerable? What are the major moments in your studio career that has completely transformed your work? So it's two for yeah, that's a hard one. I mean, it's hard to be vulnerable overall. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Makes it hard. <laughs> well, I don't, I think, well, for me, that anecdote, the, the gift that was handed me by the, the Japanese was a watershed. I no longer felt ashamed of where I was getting my ideas you know, that it was all right for me to, you know, extemporize my own culture. Mm -hmm. Sure, maybe it's it's poor taste. That the bad taste has been levied at me for 50 years. I don't I don't care anymore. That's what that's what we do here. It's, you know, the the low the language, as David Hickey put it when he wrote about me, the language of colored lights in dark places. And that was a real um that was a gift if that answers that question i no longer felt that i was doing something i shouldn't have been doing mm -hmm. that makes sense no that makes yeah. complete sense definitely um Vic, any vulnerable moments um i think you know i think that my work it can be vulnerable i think that there's certainly room to make it even more vulnerable and i think that that's something that I think about is like the discomfort of vul vulnerability. And I think that, um, I, I, you know, I'm not sure that it at this moment in my career that I am ready to go to that place, but I certainly think about it a lot. And like, you know, what does it mean to be fully exposed and like, fully exposed through art and honestly I think maybe the way that that for me kind of transcends is like most likely probably I think the one thing would be is like through performance art I just there's something about performance art that means that you have to be completely well you I mean for me being present but like yeah I mean I think that that's another way of um dealing with performance that's that that noise is I, I'm in Brooklyn right now, so I feel like you probably hear all these noises and such. Um let's see what else. I think there's one more question. Um yes, um, we have one more question. Sorry, Vic, were you gonna answer the the No, question? I I just I thought that there might be one more. I wasn't sure. Um, it was just major moments in studio career that's transformed your work. But, is that the um, question? That is the second question for Anna. Um, but we also have a question, a surprise question from Wesley Harvey, who wants to ask their question. So I might have him ask just so we don't run out of time. Okay. Um, and Wesley, you're going to do this. You're just going to ask personally, right? <laughs> sure. You know, Mark oh, knows yeah. if I got something to say, I'm going to say it to his face. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, it's not a follow-up question from your last lecture. I'm not going to do that tonight. Okay, um, sadly. 
I can go there, but I'm not. I'm going to be professional. Um, and this is for both of you, because I'm curious as someone who's my work, and Mark knows this, is starting to get a little more confrontational in your face, but in a good way, you know, things with queer theory and homoeroticism that, you know, aren't always spoken about. But how do the two of you feel about, like, do you think there are enough younger voices, queer voices in our field who are using their platform as a visual artist to say, to speak their minds enough? Because I feel like this were in like a political and social era that, you know, could potentially, well, we know what could happen. Um, and I just feel like there could be more voices, you know, saying stronger things. How do you all feel about that? I'm, I mean, I think that because we're inundated with, with like cis straight, heteronormative culture and it outnumbers queer culture by a lot i i would say you know keep on making and keep on pushing keep on pushing queer artwork or subversive art that sort of challenges like the heteronormative like rhetoric because i think that you know it needs to i mean i think what's important is that we sort of start thinking about how it's not just one way, like it could be multiple ways. Like there could be multiple ways of like being and living. And I think that it's important to, to always have like that subversive, like queer aesthetics to, uh, like I've said, like to offset what's already happening in society. So yeah, make it, do it, like put it out there. I don't think there's enough. What am I supposed to say? You should see this stuff he's making, but I think it's very necessary right now. Place reached a kind of complacency in a way. And uh, uh, and I'll be really, really stick my neck out here. I look at a lot of stuff because that's my nature. That's teaching. So, and six, a lot of times 60% of what I see looks exactly alike. I can't tell who's making what. Because ceramics is no different than fashion or automobiles or food. There's always a, a sort of peak moment where something's really, everybody's doing it. And mostly it's because there's there might be money at the end of it. And so the mavericks have returned. And so what Wes is asking is, because Wes and I are really good friends, and uh, he's making some really necessary work, I think. That spirit, that sort of, you know, FAFO he's it's going to come it's coming around again and i see younger people doing it because i think that um it's in it's indelible in people to simply speak out for themselves and i think that that um my interest is mainly in the people who just as i you know they they com they're compelled to do this they're compelled to do these things and um i think that um embracing that and making space for those things is like really, really important. So how's that, Wes? Did I pass? Yeah, you pass. Wes, Wes, I also want to say something is that, you know, I think that we can look, um, we can look at the history of um, culture wars. You know, the culture wars, I don't know if you all know what would happen um, but there was artists that were making really like Ron Athey is somebody who I can think about who was making work like really subversive, queer, homoerotic artwork. And I want to say it was it was either 80s or 90s. My dates aren't might be a little off, but then it he had like an NEA grant and then they pulled it back. And it was like it was a it was a big controversy. But because what was happening in that time is queer artists were sort of gaining traction and and people in politics realized what was happening and they sort of wanted to like stop it and sort of like 
because people understand like the power of art. People understand that art eventually is like shifting culture and it's, it's a representation. And um, so a lot of people were trying to really quell this like surge of queer artists. So what I'm just saying is that I think that those forces are still here. If you look at laws that are trying to be passed and if, honestly, there's like so much scary things that are down the pipeline that I'm just like, keep on making your art. Like it's, it's really important to do that kind of art. So that's something else to think about. I think a lot of, there's the, the one last thing here is that I mm -hmm. spend a lot of time looking at, at things and um, I see a lot more gay, queer, transgender people making their own spaces. And one thing I follow is Jack Sanders' Homo Surrealism magazine. I keep trying to, uh, I've been in it, but I've been trying to get him to feature more three-dimensional work, you know, so it doesn't totally slide over into total porn. Mm -hmm. But there are things like that, groups of people that are interested in, in promoting, looking and discussing these things. It's really, mm -hmm. I think it's really important. So I agree. I mean, there's some hard times coming down the pike if things go the way they are. And uh, I think that the, the idea that um, the human spirit's indomitable. You're just going to make what you think you need to make. And that's, uh, that's I used to tell my profs and they get after me and say, you know, if they don't like it here, they'll like it in Milwaukee. And of course, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if it reaches one person, mm -hmm. then it's successful. It real, it's successful. That's and, a great uh, way to look at it, honestly, yeah. Lauren. Well, thank you so much, Wesley, for that wonderful question. And thank you, Mark and Vic, for taking the time. You're very welcome. Today, I know that on your time zone, um, it's much more later, and I'm sure you all both are very I, tired. I took my pants off a while ago, so that's, that's <laughs> something. I love that. So, <laughs> Get comfortable. But, so anyway, uh, if, you're, if you're in Sika, uh, Wesley and I are uh, doing a, a mentor-mentee show, aren't we, Wes? Yes. And will there be a, a discussion? Mm -hmm. I think that'd be a, I don't and, know. And, I and we're so. looking for, we're looking forward to that, right? Love so. that. Definitely share that with us and we'd be happy to share that on our social media. But I will, forever, I will do that. Mm -hmm. And whoever's in the neighborhood, just um, if you ever want to catch an experience making in between queer clay for yourself, um, that will be up until the end of this year. Okay. Um, Amoka is open Friday, Saturday, and Sundays, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. And uh, also remind that we have a gorgeous catalog and very cute queer clay bandanas for purchase online or in person. All right. Sounds good. Thank you so much for the catalog. It's beautiful. Vic, lovely to meet you. And, yeah, Mark, uh, same. It was really nice talking. Great talk. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much.